recording in progress. Love that. Awesome. So as we wait for more people to join, I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of um, this webinar. So we'll be talking about all things community management. We are joined today by our, you might have seen her before, but since then she has been promoted to account director. So our account director, Chloe. Hello. Hello. <laughs> She is the best, and we're so excited to have her on here. And she is also the queen of community management. So literally could not have had anybody else um, better on this particular chat. Um, <laughs> I'm also just going to make sure that our um, chat function is working. One second. Can everybody pop a hello in there if it's working or not? Sound off in the chat. All that's right, good. it's that's working. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Love that because that's how we know that you guys are actually engaging. And yes, congratulations, Chloe. Love Thank that you. so much. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome to the webinar. Um, quick intro to me. If you're new here, I'm Melina. I'm the head of partnerships at Nonsense Coal. We are a TikTok only agency, fully focused and TikTok experts from all over the UK, fully remote. And we just get brands impact on TikTok. How many times can I say TikTok in a sentence? Um, thank you so much for joining. We do these webinars about once a month um, and we do loads of different topics, um, but I will hand over to Chloe to give her intro as well. Yes. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here today. Um, I am, yeah, a new account director here at Nonsense School. So very exciting times. And I will be adding Queen of Community Management to my resume. Thank you um, for that title, Melina. But yeah, my new role is kind of all about making sure that we're putting all of our energy and creativity into how we show up and engage online um, for behalf of our clients and just make sure that all the ideas that we bring to life are pushing the envelope and doing the unexpected. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. And yeah, very excited to be talking about engagement today. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you for that. Um, just as a little icebreaker, if you could put in the chat any brands that you've been seeing particularly or doing a particularly good job at community management lately. So whether that's responding to comments, Emma, if, if I'm saying that right, I don't think I've seen them. Refi, oh. yes, love them. Um, but yeah, so if you could put that in there, that could be responding to comments, either creating videos off the back of some of the engagement that they're getting. Just let us know who's inspiring you these days, and we'll jump right into our conversation. Just as a reminder, this is being recorded. It will be shared with anybody who is able to join and also anyone who wasn't able to join. So if you have to hop out halfway through, we know you guys are busy, so it will be coming through to your inbox tomorrow. With all of that said... Let's kick off with a really general question, just to set the scene. Why do we think that community management is so important and what are the main benefits? Yeah, I mean, what a good question to kick off with. To me, community management like is the social in social media, right? It's a chance to give your brand a personality outside of the day-to-day -day messaging that you're putting out there and just connect with your audience on a human level. I feel like sometimes a lot of brands are just speaking at people and not kind of creating that two-way open communication and over I think especially with TikTok over the last couple of years like a lot of brands have become famous just from being good at community engagement and community management and just interacting with their audience if we think of Ryan Eyre and Duolingo like they're a little bit toxic I would say with their community management but it works and people love it and like people comment on their videos just to get a response. They may have nothing to do with those brands outside of social, but they kind of live for that interaction, right? So I think those are kind of the, I'm, I guess like vanity benefits from it, from a brand perspective, but from like a day to day, it also helps you understand your audience and like, what are their needs? What are their struggles? What questions do they have? And when you listen to, you know, those questions and those struggles and those pain points, you can create content accordingly and you can respond to them accordingly. And yeah, just kind of build up that trust that you are listening and you are a sounding board for them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Honestly, barely anything to add. I would just kind of build on what you said because I think the point of listening is so important because I mean, I think across the board, the most important thing in any marketing campaign, any marketing activity is understanding who your audience is 
And there's no easier way to do that than listening to what they are directly telling you. So any comments that come across, anything that they tell you, you have to take it at face value and being able to listen, adapt, whether it's from a content perspective or a product perspective, even like you ask for feedback and they're directly giving it to you. So how you can engage with them will just kind of help build the trust, let them know that you care because that helps build that relationship as well. Um, and beyond that, hopefully brand loyalty over a long, longer period of time. 100%. I'm brand advocacy. Like, look how many of you have already like shout out Refai and like all of these brands in this webinar alone. Like I'm going to go away and have a look at their accounts off the back of this. So it's like you guys in turn have become massive advocates for these brands and like word of mouth marketing is so real. Definitely, definitely. And community management is a huge part. Yes, posting content is going to get the conversation started, but how to keep the conversation going all comes down to community management. So with that said, now that we understand why we need to be doing this, um, what are some best practices? How can you effectively engage with your followers specifically on TikTok? But like I said, this can go across the board on any platform. Yeah, I feel like you just like referenced it before, Melina. I think it comes down to like understanding who you're talking to, but then on the flip side, understand who you're talking for, um, like who you're talking to. You need to know who who is your brand or your clients, in our case, target audience, like where do they exist on TikTok already and what do they find relatable? I think if we look at students, for example, yes, a lot of them are going to be sitting in sort of like university talk and like engaging in content around that, but they're also looking for jobs. They're interested in like nightlife and going out. They're interested in relationships. There are a lot of little subgroups and cultures that they exist in. So once you have like a really good understanding of where they are, what they find relatable, you can then go and infiltrate those spaces and you can interact with their posts or other brands and creators posts so that you're like consistently showing up and joining those conversations that they're already in. And then equally important is like to know who you're talking for, right? Like you need to have the best understanding of your brand and what they value so that you can create that established tone of voice. Like how do you want to be interacting with these people once you've found them? Are you their friend? Are you an advocate for them? Are you a teacher to them? Like, are you trying to help them learn things? Like, I know we'll get into that kind of tone of voice stuff a little bit later, but it's so important, as well as just understanding the boundaries and limitations of your brand or like on social media. Like, what are the conversations that they're not willing to take part in? How, like, what are the, is the type of language that they don't want to use or that they don't kind of associate with. I think that's maybe a bit of an underrated point for a lot of people. Like we're all kind of, especially on TikTok, I think people want to be like really unhinged and be like real bestie and like pooky with their audience, but that just doesn't fit some brands. And like a lot of them don't necessarily want to go there. So I think when you understand your limitations, it kind of almost highlights where you need to be showing up and what conversations you need to be starting a little bit more. Does that make sense? Does. I think you hit a lot of really great points. Um, I see that Melissa also caught the relatability point. I think that's absolutely huge. But then also understanding who you're talking for, because the last thing you want to do is come across as inauthentic. Like if you are trying to be everybody's best friend, but your brand is a very serious brand, it's just not going to add up and people are going to be able to feel that. So having that really clear cut before you um, before you go into this activity, clear cut understanding of what exactly you're trying to get across in this community management is going to be huge. So it is a bit of a strategy piece. There is also a bit of testing and learning, but understanding your brand values is always going to be number one, as well as understanding who your audience are. Um, one of the things that you mentioned as well, in terms of best practices, it's not just about um, engaging with comments that come across on your own account and your own content, but showing up in other places. So commenting on other brand accounts, other creator accounts. Can you just go into that a little bit more um, in terms of how do you find those right pieces of content to then engage with that aren't your own? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think for people who come to a lot of our webinars, this is like 
we get it. Find your top. We talk about it all the time, but I think it's, it's so important. And even off of TikTok, like on other social media platforms, it's like, what are those communities that you want to be a part of and that your audiences sit in? Because once you have that understanding, you can start having a look at competitors in the space. You can have a look at what other brands, maybe they're not direct competitors, but they are, you know, within that space um, and creators as well. Like who are the top creators in like university talk to go back to that previous example, like who are kind of the big voices there? Because I think those are the videos that you want to be interacting with as well. And also like, yeah, trying to create that top comment moment, because when you get the top comment on a video, you are essentially like top of the top of that comment section every time anyone goes in there. And even if someone's never heard of your brand before, they're like, oh, that's that's quite funny. Like, let's click onto there. So in a way, you're almost like hijacking other people's moments of virality or other people's moments of connection with their own audiences and just like inserting yourself into that conversation, which I think as well as like a, a little bit of a, an underrated skill. We talk a lot about like responding to your own comments, but not a lot of people invest time in like going out there and interacting with other people's content. And with TikTok, especially like there's so many viral moments and like so many sort of trends and cultural phenomenons that are flying around that the comment section is always the best part, right? Like everyone's going straight to the comment section on any video. So if you get that top comment and you invest time in like thinking of a, a witty response or giving your two cents or providing value and driving that conversation even further, you're going to just see like that return almost instantly because people like they respond, they come and visit your page as a response. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> it, did, it did. Thank you so much. I think there's 100% that element of finding the right talk. We have lots of other um, resources on our websites that kind of go into that in a little bit more detail. So we'll be sure to share that. But um, what we do at the strategy stage, kind of answering one of your questions, Eleanor, about how to kind of understand your tone of voice and slash A-B testing, we do kind of set out a, a guide for tone of voice up front. And also we do a bit of a search on who is really active in our talk that we're looking to go after. And the great thing about TikTok is that the For You page is always learning. So the more that you interact with these people in your talk that are just performing really well, the more TikTok will start to serve you um, other content that's also being served to your audience. So that will just kind of help make your job a little bit easier because then you'll say, okay, this obviously is in line with what we're talking to and use your best judgment because sometimes there will be the odd rogue one, but it will also help you to understand what else your audience might be connecting with and where you could be interacting based on what you set out in that strategy phase. In terms of testing, you're always going to have a little bit of A-B testing, but having that guide and understanding up front is going to help you understand what to test down the line. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Anything else to add there before we go on to the next question? No, I just think on the A-B testing point, Eleanor, like you never kind of feel like you need to stick to one thing. Like I think brands on social and your tone of voice as a brand is constantly evolving and so is your audience. So like you may start out, you know, speaking to them in one style or only interacting with a certain kind of post and you'll find that over time that changes. And when you build up a bit more of a community that maybe you speak to those people a little bit differently because they're kind of in on the joke and you are kind of like familiar. So definitely don't limit yourself ever, but it is a good sort of starting point to just have an understanding of like how you want to speak to these people and then let it grow organically. Love that. Completely agree because um, you kind of do become best friends with your audience down the line. If the, For those people that have been engaging with you for a long time, they'll make it known and they'll say, I've been following you since X date or whatever it might be. So those are the people that you know are really champion, champion I cannot say that word, but <laughs> rooting for you. That's what I'm going to say because it's easier. Um, you know the people that are rooting for you and you want them to feel like they're a part of it. Um, really quick, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but Christina is one of our team members. So she'll be popping in useful links throughout the entire webinar based on what we discussed. But love this. Um, one of the biggest things I think about community management is making your audience feeling, or making your audience feel really welcomed and included and in on the joke, which you kind of just talked about. I, I think it's a little hard to really quantify, but are there any learnings that you've had on how you can implement that kind of environment and build that from scratch? 
Yeah, I feel like inclusive and inclusivity is a key word here, particularly for outbound community management and also, I guess, in the content that you're creating as well, um, because you need to be interacting with a diverse range of creators and audiences and creating content that's tailored to their needs. So a good example of this, and I've seen it thrown around a lot, it's like a big talking point in marketing, is like Gen Z, right? People are like, my audience is Gen Z. And when you think of Gen Z, you are thinking of unhinged, just total chaos, only interested in like silly memes and emojis. But actually Gen Z covers from like people my age, which is getting on the older side now. <laughs> and then people like way, way younger than me, right? So the the types of interests that we have and the way that we talk and the things that we're aligned with are not all the same. So I don't think it's useful to kind of look at your audience under an umbrella or give them like a blanket term like Gen Z's, for example. And to go back to the student thing that I keep referencing, like, don't forget that students, like there are mature age students. There are students that come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. There are students who have learning difficulties. Like there is such a broad spectrum, spectrum, sorry, within your audience. So make sure that you're joining conversations and creating stories or content that reflects their reality too. Um, because yeah, everyone's different. So I just think the more you can kind of speak to different sub audiences or categories within that that kind of wider being is is really important because you then equally like if you're not kind of reflecting different uh realities different um life views and stuff like you're then isolating them which I don't think is is very um inclusive at all so that's definitely super important to consider um and then yeah just making sure that you're being super welcoming in all of your community management like you're a human on the end of the phone. Like, yes, you're reflecting a brand, but like you are a person. So I hate seeing like people who reply with just an emoji or like a one word, like you're not, you're ending the conversation there essentially. So if someone takes the time to comment on a video, make sure that you take the time to respond and you ask them a question or you continue that conversation and that you're being relatable and you're being human. So I think that's also really important. I love that. You made so many good points there. And the whole um, inclusivity part, it just, it, it keeps going back to truly understanding your audience. I think from a paid perspective, um, we are so used to being able to put age brackets and saying target anyone 18 to 24 and just pushing your content out there. But when you're actually having that conversation, that age bracket doesn't work. People within 18 to 24 are multifaceted. They have lots of different interests, lots of different things that affect them on a daily basis. So truly, truly understanding your audience is going to be a huge part of great community management. Um, and there is, again, it kind of comes back to what we were saying before about finding the right talk, understanding what they are genuinely interested in, what they're genuinely bothered by. Um, and that can come from a lot of research. So take a look at those resources that we put in the chat, because I think that kind of helps you get to the point where you understand them a little bit better. But as a brand, there should be nobody that understands your audience better than you. So just build on that. And it's going to be an evolving thing as well, because people are changing, people grow, and they're learning. So as a brand, you have to do that alongside them. And with that, you'll build that inclusivity as well. Amazing. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about gen general best practices, let's talk about the content a bit and maintain maintaining the activity. So mm -hmm. quick question, how do you determine what content resonates most with your audience? Um, and then how does that relate to kind of staying topical, staying on top of trends? Because there are so many trends happening all the time. There are so many big pop culture moments, but like you shouldn't necessarily be jumping on all of them, right? So how do you make that decision and how does that kind of feed into community management? Mm, yeah, this is like, this is a, a whole beast on its own. And also I feel like we need to do a webinar around understanding your audience because that is today's like buzzword. We keep saying you have to understand your audience. So if anyone needs help with that, shout and like we will create a whole separate session on that because I'm conscious we keep saying it, but maybe people need help in that area too. Um, but yeah, when it comes to creating your content, you want to create 
videos that elicit an emotion from your audience, right? That's always the biggest thing for me. Like, what's the goal? Do we want people to laugh? Do we want them to feel nostalgic? Do we want to rage bait them a little bit? Like, because when you kind of trigger those emotions in people, they're going to react. And that often kind of manifests in like comments or shares and like that community engagement that we're sort of looking for, right? So the best thing that I like to start with is settling down on a common or relatable pain point or passion point doesn't always have to be like pain and just create content around that and start a conversation around that so a really good example um is one of our clients into flora we somehow discovered that our audience is obsessed with gossip girl um, and we found that out because we created videos around peonies because Interflora is a flower brand and we just like peonies are massive in Gossip Girl. If you know, you know, I won't get into it. We don't have time, but we created some content around Gossip Girl through this peony connection, right? And the girlies loved it. They just ate it up. So that for us, as often as we can, without kind of becoming a Gossip Girl fan page, we try and weave Gossip Girl and Blair and Serena and Peonies into our content because we know that that is like a massive passion point for our audience. So I think that's super important. Equally, take a step back and maybe ask yourself, like, what do you want to learn from your audience? What do you want to ask them? And what will you then do? Like, how will you leverage that information when they speak back to you, right? Because your audience is like always asking questions. They have these pain points. And if you're not listening, then you are kind of hindering your own sort of workflow, right? Because you can create so many videos off the back of these questions or of these learnings that you have from them. Um, so that's really important. And then I guess just on the topic of trends, um, it's just all about being as reactive as possible. Um, and we spoke about a little bit in my last webinar around creativity is like, you can almost pinpoint these moments in the, the calendar year that you know are going to get big cultural moments from. So like the Love Island finale, for example, or the Oscars or the Met Gala or the Olympics more recently, we always know that there's going to be some, some big meme that comes out of those. So it's just like planning ahead and having those jokes or those like meme templates set up ready to go so that when they happen you can just react straight away or just even having it back of mind clearing an hour in your calendar that morning to be like I am going to be like scaling the internet for opportunities to like capitalize on this big moment um because yeah it's all just about hijacking it and trying to get that top comment and trying to start those conversations um and understand how to create content around it so I think a really good example recently is like Brat and Charlie XCX. Like that has been our focus at the agency for like weeks and weeks now. Like we're all having a Brat Girl summer. So we just know it's like, it kind of, it does work. Not for every client, obviously. Some people don't, are not Brat. They're a bit more demure and that's fine. Um, but it's just like, how do we kind of weave that language of like Brat Girl summer into our comments? Or how do we create content that kind of, implicates that we're having a brat girl summer you know what I mean like just trying to always be turned on and switched on to what's happening around you and weave that into the content that you create love it love it so I think there's a couple things like you said it can't always be applicable to every single brand so brat for example might not be the best thing for a I don't know a, a pharma company that's probably not the best example but that's what came to my mind but that really just comes down to knowing who you're speaking for again. So I think we're going to do a lot of referencing back. So there's understanding your audience, which seems to be the real buzz. But then there's also understanding who you're speaking for. So trends are really powerful. And I think a lot of brands kind of fall into the, um, I guess, trap of wanting to be really relevant and topical and jumping on every single trend. But at that point, where is the genuine personality behind that brand. So when you are a little bit more selective with trends and, and what you talk about, what you engage with or what content you create, that helps to frame your personality as a brand more and more. If you're just jumping on a cap cut trend for trend's sake, what is that audience gonna remember about you? Is it just that you had one really funny cap cut or are they gonna understand a little bit more about your values and your passion points as Chloe said? So. Just remember, trends are great, but they are only powerful and useful if you are being a little bit more selective with it. So hopping mm -hmm. on every single trend we try to avoid across all of our clients, 
they are still a big part of every strategy we put together. We want to re remain reactive, but there is a huge part uh, that needs to be highlighted that we are not jumping on every trend for trend's sake. There is more value in original content and original community management in terms of how you're responding, those, com those conversations that you're sparking versus just jumping on a trend for trend's sake. Lovely. Anything else to add on that one? No, I think we I think we nailed it. <laughs> Love that. Cool. So when it comes to consistency, because obviously if you get a really big hit, you're going to get a load of comments. You're going to get a lot of opportunity to interact with your audience. How do you kind of go about that? Or do you have any strategies to maintain that engagement, to keep it as strong as it is? What are your, your tips? Yeah, I feel like, there, there are some more specific strategies, like we've mentioned, like knowing what sort of similar brands or creators or influencers in your talk that you want to interact with and kind of consistently participating in their conversations. But when it really comes down to it, it's like community management and engaging with your audience. It's It takes time and it takes focus and you need to be in it to make it effective. So my kind of big thing is always just block some time out every day, like check your inbounds at the start of every working day. And before you log off at the end of um, every working day, like who's commented on your post, has anyone DM'd you? Like what is all of that inbound interactions? That to me is like a, a daily task really, because it's not a good look for you as a brand of like, you're not responding to comments. I think that is like the, maybe one of the first impressions people get from you on, on social media is they see your content and then they have a look at your comment section. And if you've got like five comments in there of people, maybe they're not always asking genuine questions. Maybe they're just being like, lol. And I hate that when like people comment things that you can't really respond to. It's my worst nightmare. But if you're not kind of engaging in that conversation, it, it does reflect poorly on you as a brand at the end of the day. And it's not very kind of genuine or authentic. So Absolutely. Every morning, every night, I just check the inbounds and I make sure that every single comment is replied to. Um, again, like I mentioned, some people just comment like laughing emojis of something's funny and you, it's hard to work with that. So maybe you just give it a like, but those genuine comments um, always respond to those. And then I just set a time aside every week for outbound, like active outbound interactions. Maybe it's you know, an hour at the end of the week, or maybe it's like 15 minute blocks throughout the course of each day. But outbound is super important as well, especially on TikTok where, yeah, as we've said, there are always these big things, big moments happening. Um, it's just all about kind of jumping on those. Um, and I think I saw someone in the comments say like, what if, yeah, you can't jump on a trend or like your trend doesn't get signed off in time. It's all about the language that you use as well. I'm so big about thinking about again, where applicable, like what's the TikTok way of saying this, of saying like, thank you, or of saying, I don't know, like saying I'm in my ex era, like just using that really native TikTok language and when responding to your comments, again, it's not always possible for every client. Some people are a little bit more reserved and that's about knowing your limitations. But if you can't participate in the trend through your content, just make sure that you're like living that, that trend or that cultural moment through your language or through, I don't know, yeah, the comments that you leave. Love that. I would also just add, use the tools at your disposal. It's kind of hard to be witty all the time. So the <laughs> likes of AI can really come into uh, come in handy for stuff like this. So if you have a if you have a comment that you're like really racking your brain on how to respond, ask your good old friend ChatGPT to come back with five witty comments. It might not be the perfect one, but hopefully it will spark some inspiration for how you can reply. So. And also the more that you give it, the more it will learn. So if you could put in some previous responses that you've had before, and then say, these are some of the previous responses that we've done that are perfect in terms of tone of voice. This is the question that we just got. Give me five examples that align with that previous tone of voice and go from there. So there's a little bit of a, a cross between organization and creativity that goes into community management and using the tools that you have are just a great way of making sure you're able to stay on top of it. 100%. Yeah. Love. So let's go into the tone of voice part, because I think that's a big part of community management, understanding how you want to come across as a brand. Um, so how do you go about developing a unique 
and non-cringy, authentic uh, tone of voice on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is the juicy stuff now. I think um, I want to preface this by saying it takes time to nail down. And as we mentioned previously, like it will constantly evolve. So don't restrict yourself to one way of doing things. And also don't put pressure on yourself to get it right straight away. Like I've worked with a lot of clients where in our first week together, I've been, you know, responding to comments and they've come back and said, actually, Chloe, like that's, that is not us. And they've actually like sent me little tone of voice presentations to be like, here you go. You look like you could use this, which I love. And those are so helpful as well. So it takes time and don't put pressure on yourself to get it right straight away because it will constantly evolve regardless. Um, I think step one is just like, be a human and respond as a human. As I said, use first person language instead of third person. Like I think for a lot of people, when you're working on behalf of a brand, like your first instinct is to reply as like, we love that for you or we couldn't agree more. But like you are one person on the end of that that message. So like respond in first person, use eyes. Again, that ties into, you know, some brands do have stricter guidelines around that and obviously follow that first. But yeah, just how do you be human in your response? Um, know your limits as well is a really good one. Like when you go to comment, just ask yourself, like, does this fit the brand's tone of voice? Again, on TikTok, it's so easy to get swept up in like calling people pooky or like using emojis. But if it's not reflective of like your brand and who they are, then maybe just, you know, second guess that yourself. And also ask yourself if it makes sense to engage here. Talk a lot about trends. And Melina, you already said, like, does it make sense for you actually to participate in this trend? And like original content is way more valuable. So it it goes the same with like where you're showing up and what conversations that you're having. Like, don't force it. If it's not, doesn't come naturally to you as a brand, then like, that's fine. Give it a miss. There's always something else around the corner that you can engage in. Um, and then, yeah, just an, another tip for me is just thinking about that TikTok language where it's relevant. So starting POV, for example, is, is very TikTok or being like girlhood is, or it's giving broke, like that kind of language. It's not pushing the boundaries too far. So I think it's relatively brand safe, but it does just like make, make your content like a lot more native and how you're speaking a lot more native to TikTok that is. Maybe it's not as applicable as like LinkedIn, for example. Um, but Melina, I know we like do so much strategy work around tone of voice. So I'm keen to hear like your perspective. I've gone over like the fun fluffy stuff, but there's some, a lot more strategic elements that go into it. <laughs> well, I mean, I would just say it really has to be brand led because I think there is, I, I have no one size fits all answer because every single brand is going to stand for something different and be um, aligned more with a certain tone of voice than another. But what we do for every single brand that we onboard is we have a really in-depth discovery session. It is a minimum of two hours where we just ask a load of different questions in terms of what they are comfortable having published on TikTok by us. And that includes the level of unhingedness. I think one of the questions that we genuinely ask is, on a scale of one to 10, how unhinged do you think your brand is? And a lot of times we'll get somebody who says, I am a 10 unhinged. And we're like, okay, let me challenge you on that. This is what a 10 unhinged looks like. Do you still think you're a 10? And most of the times it's a no. So we have lots of back and forth, lots of collaborative efforts with the brand to truly understand what that tone of voice is. Then we take it away and we put together a little bit of a Goldilocks examples where we say this is too hot or like too comfortable for a brand to be speaking with their audience. This is too cold and not really welcoming for this brand to be speaking to their audience. And this is just right. And we send that across and we see if they are, if what we've recommended is on point. And again, it is a learning um it is a learning experience, but it is also something that genuinely evolves. Um, Abigail just asked, do you have any examples of truly unhinged brands you see on TikTok? And I would say, I would say Ryanair is unhinged, but also a 10 out of 10 Safi. I think mm -hmm. unhinged and Safi are two different things. Like their comebacks, they don't, they do not care. If your customer, they don't mind upsetting the customer, and that is very unique to them. If a customer is going to complain about their seat, they're going to say, well, you got a really good deal on this and they're happy about that. Whereas another unhinged brand is the 
the Royal Society of Birds. I can't, what is? I can't remember exactly what the acronym is. Yeah. But they are a historical brand, and if you look at their content, it is so random, so unhinged in their editing, where it just feels completely unlike anything you would get from a heritage brand, heritage brand like them. So I would just take a look at them for examples. But unfortunately, like I said, there's no one size fits all answer. It comes down to truly understanding your brand and who you're speaking for. Definitely. And I think as well, just to add, it's like, um, I know for us, like we, we work with like a lot of clients, so they have their own teams, but some people like work in-house. So it's a little bit different, but don't be afraid to like ask for that direction. And a lot of brands do kind of already have this um, kind of brand guideline deck that details their tone of voice um, quite clearly. Like some brands have it more in depth than others, but definitely like when you're first getting started, like it's a bit of a collaborative effort and like you can soundboard off with them. It's not like a, a weakness to not get it straight away. So any examples that they can give you either from how they do it themselves or on other channels or internally, or even like, who do they look up to on social? If you say like, I think our question for Unhinged is like on a scale of one to Duolingo or Ryanair, like how unhinged do you want to be? So like providing those examples and being like, is this what you mean or is this what you mean is always just, again, a really good way to help you get started and, and really help you get under the skin of them. Definitely. I think, and it also just comes down to what you're comfortable doing. Cause if you're forcing it, if you feel uncomfortable being 10 out of 10 unhinged, it's not going to come across authentic. So test what you're comfortable uh, coming across as an, as a tone of voice perspective, but then also learn and grow with what is resonating best with your audience. And I think one of the main things here is maintaining the consistency in tone of voice. Like, yes, we're saying that this evolves and it grows, but mm -hmm. what is the importance of kind of having that similar thread of tone across all of your community management? Why is it important to have that? Yeah, I feel like for me anyway, it almost helps you, like it helps your audience establish an identity of your brand, like in their minds. So like every time that they speak to you, like they, like you are kind of like a friend or you know what to expect. Like we know that Ryanair is going to come back and be like, I don't care if you're not sitting next to your best friend. Like you should have paid more. Like that's just how we roll. Do you know what I mean? So um, when people kind of connect with you on TikTok or connect with your brand's personality, they're also more likely to seek you out elsewhere. Like not everyone follows brands across all of their different platforms or even like is a consumer or a customer of theirs. Like I'm, uh, that's a lie I have flown with Ryanair but like I don't follow them on any other channels but I do follow them on TikTok but because I love them so much on TikTok it does make me want to go and have a look at their Instagram see what they're doing on LinkedIn or even just like they are top of mind when I'm trying to find cheap flights um, mainly because they're cheap not just because of their community management but it's definitely a factor so I think that's really important um, and I think yeah more than anything it just makes your brand recognizable across all all of your platforms and therefore it's like I feel like some people especially with TikTok we see a lot of people who want to do really fun unhinged crazy stuff on TikTok and then they're like a completely different brand on LinkedIn understandably it's a different tone of voice there but like there's no connect across all the platforms or like how you would speak to customer service versus how you would speak to someone on TikTok for example so I think it just helps build that trust um, between your audience that like yeah they know what to expect when they ever have an interaction with you um, I think a really good example of that is SEMrush across all of their social media channels like their the way that they respond like I think they have teams that like are checking every single comment and they're always like really funny and really relatable to digital marketers and they just do it so well like I see people on LinkedIn create posts just around their community management strategy it's so crash hot like they're just a really good example of like you know what to expect no matter where you interact with them it's the same tone of voice and it's so consistent and it's it's just brilliant I absolutely love their tone of voice I also just wanted to add while we're while we uh touched on Ryanair a couple times one of actually our very first webinar we ever did was with the old head of social at Ryanair and one of the things he said is like their position was very unique in the fact that they already had that USP of being the cheapest way to fly. So their positioning on 
all platforms, but especially TikTok and other social media platforms, was not hinged on getting, um, was not hinged on retaining customers because they knew at the end of the day when a client or sorry, a customer needed to fly somewhere really cheap, they would still be the best option. So that's why they made the decision to be completely unhinged. And that, again, goes back to understanding where, what are your boundaries as a brand? Are you able to do that? Are you comfortable doing that? And it's worked out really well for them. Because again, similar to SEMrush, I see loads of different posts on LinkedIn talking about their social media um, or community management approach. And they just have a lot of fun with it. But they're also, as a brand, allowing themselves to. So it all comes down to who you are, what you're comfortable doing, have that conversation if you're working with the client uh, to understand how far you want to push it. Because like I said, in our strategy discussion, that's a lot of what we do. How far can we push it? Do we need to be safe? Can we be a little bit more brave and unhinged? But it comes from the brand and they should be the one that leads you on that. Because if it comes from anyone else, it's just going to come across as inauthentic. Awesome. Okay. So I think we've kind of touched on the consistency of tone of voice and how to kind of keep up um, that or maintain that presence more like. But do you think that there is an element of frequency? Like, is there a right frequency that is necessary to maximize engagement? Yeah, I think best practice, as I've mentioned, is to reply to every comment, like really, really try and set some time aside. In terms of the frequency, I would say whenever you post a video on TikTok, that first hour that it's live is crucial. Um, every comment that comes in, you want to be responding to it. You want to be also in that time that you posted a little bit before, a lot of it after, interacting with other people in the space. Like you want to tell the algorithm, hey, I'm online. I have just posted. Please feed my content out there. So I think that first hour is, is super duper crucial. And it's it's not like be glued to your phone for the first hour, but just like check in periodically, reply to any new comments. After that first hour, any any reply that you make is an opportunity to bring someone back to your content, right? They've maybe they've never commented or they've just commented and they've left it. You want to bring them back because that watch time just kind of keeps pushing you up um, in the algorithm and, and shows your content to more people. So a lot of people I see, like someone leaves a comment, you reply, and then maybe they reply and you're like, no, no, conversation's over. Like we're, we're done here. I've done my job. I've replied. I've ticked the box. If they come back to you and reply again, like you've got a conversation on your hands. Like let's be social. This is social media. You're basically every time you reply, you are bringing them back to that, that video of yours. So even like when you get comments are a little bit neggy, if then, you know, unless you've like deleted them because they're like really rude or whatever. But like, even if someone's having a jab at you, reply to it, because guess what? It brings them back to your video and you've got an extra view. And also they've engaged, like, just be like, thanks. Thanks for the engagement. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I think that's really important. And then one other thing I would say is don't ignore new comments on old videos which I am sometimes guilty of. I see a comment come in. I'm like, oh, that video was like weeks ago. I'm just going to leave it. That is an indication that like your content is still out there. It's still being shown to more people. We know this on TikTok in particular, just because you posted something and it flopped doesn't mean that in three weeks time, it's going to skyrocket up to like thousands of views. Like it's, it's all evergreen, right? So if people begin commenting on old videos, don't neglect that. Go back and engage with them because A, it's a good sign that your content is still out there, but B, it's like, maybe that is still the first time they're interacting with you as a brand. So if you ignore them, it's maybe it's the last time they interact with you as a brand. Um, yeah. <laughs> Completely agree. I think some good examples, um, for the Negi ones, Urban Tandoor does a great job. Um, that is one of our clients and our team is really great at kind of responding to some of the more negative comments. Unfortunately, sometimes we do get a few racist comments and that is something that we do not stand for and we make it clear in our comment section. So again, just making sure that you as a brand understand what you want to stand up for. Some brands say we do not even interact with those and that's fine. Again, it's what comes down to um, what's comfortable as a brand for you. Another great example in terms of what you said about having a conversation, I'm really loving Cheez-Its right now at the moment. So basically, Love Island USA, if you're not watching it, I know they're releasing it slowly in the UK. Love it, obsessed. 
but one of the contestants who got really big on the platform, um, he loves Cheez-Its and they're doing this whole brand collab, but Cheez-Its is, is all over his comment section, just supporting him and they're everywhere having conversations back and forth. So I would totally check that out and they're having a lot of fun with it. So it's more, again, this is more of a proactive outbound one, but they are staying on top of it. They are replying to replies and they're just having the best time and I'm loving watching it. Love it. Love yeah. It. And also just shout out to Love Island USA. It was so good this season. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Um, One of the things, oh, actually, we have a question from Melissa, which she says, she's struggling to reply to comments that are just emojis or love this. What would you reply to something like that? Yeah, you and me both, Melissa. I... <laughs> <laughs> I love any kind of engagement, but those ones I do struggle with. Um, I think it's like if someone has left a closed ended comment on your video like this, just see it as an opportunity. Like imagine you're at a party and you're talking to your friends and you make a joke and someone in the corner of the room laughs. Would you just like look at them and be like, OK, or would you be like, oh, like, you would invite them over to the conversation, right? They're, they're kind of on the periphery, like they want to engage. They're just looking for that opening maybe, or they, they don't know you, so they don't know how to kind of approach you straight away. So just like, if it makes sense, like maybe the video that you've made is, oh gosh, what could it be? What could it be? Like um, a video about marketers or like community managers who get comments that are just emojis and oh my God, it's so annoying. And then someone comments on it, lol, because they found it funny. You can be like, oh my gosh, isn't this so relatable? Or like, oh my gosh, can't relate. Or like, don't you hate it when this happens? Just like try and open them up for that conversation. Um, I think is probably the best way to do it. If it's like, there's nothing you can do, just like like it and like give them a laugh reaction back. It's not ideal. It's not the best, most valuable form of um, community management, but like they haven't given you much to work with in the first place. So I think just like use your judgment, but if there's an opportunity to just like crack them open a little bit more and like start that conversation and invite them over to the conversation, then yeah, just try and do that as much as possible. And they don't always make it easy, but like we said, try your best to reply to everything that comes through. Definitely. Lovely. Well, because a lot of us are working directly with clients, I think we are probably all well-versed in client pushback sometimes. So what? how do you educate a client on the importance of community building on TikTok? And how do you kind of get them a little bit more comfortable with um, community management, depending on what you've agreed to? Mm, this is a good one. I think whether they they say it up front or not, whether they're like, no, we just want some brand awareness. We're here to have fun. Like every client wants sales or leads like that is, you know, they want to see that return on investment. So I like to kind of just put on my business hat and speak to them in those kind of terms. So people connect with and they buy from people. They don't buy from brands. They don't like being sold to, but when you talk to them on a human level, like that's kind of where the relationship starts to grow. So community management is a great way to build trust and build up a relationship with your audience that essentially puts your foot in the door and later down the track, when you've kind of like consistently built up that relationship, you then become top of mind for them like that recall becomes stronger and stronger um it's like I said with Ryanair it wasn't the best example but like I love the way that they engage with their audience and I'm obsessed with them on TikTok so when it comes to booking flights they are top of mind so I think maybe step one is to like influence them that way just be like listen when we build up this audience and we reach new users and we have this great relationship with them they may not be ready to buy from us now but when they are we are top of mind we have already had like started those conversations because it's again it goes back to word of mouth I think again talking about advocacy like how many of you guys at the start of the chat were like shouting out your favorite brands and in this like unique space I think that's super important as well like you were turning your audience from just like passive viewers into like active advocates for you and they will kind of like speak about you in, in a room of opportunities um so yeah I think just it is spending that time and investing in community management particularly on organic it's a long-term play but that return on investment sometimes it, it's better than 
I'm not going to say it's better than paid because it's not, but like for organic, it's good because you are just, yeah, putting your foot in the door and you're just strengthening that recall and that trust and that advocacy with your audience. And I feel like that's always the best way to sell it to a client or to a business owner than it is to be like, well, it's just a bit of fun, you know? Um, so yeah. <laughs> Love that. One thing I will say, cause I think a lot of times, um, People think of TikTok as just a note, sorry, dog is leaving the chat, um, just another social media platform. And yes, it is social media, but it's also a discovery platform. And it is a little bit of a broadcast channel because it is not necessarily related to how many people follow you. It is, if people find it interesting, it can get pushed out to a lot of other dog entering the chat. Um, a lot of other eyes, a lot of other viewers. So I like to compare TikTok sometimes to the likes of a TV advert. So when it shouldn't be an ad, but the level of reach you can get can go hand in hand with what you might be able to achieve on a TV advert. But where, where you get that extra benefit is the community management. So you could get that huge, huge reach because something performed really well and you are interacting really well with the entire um and you are resonating really well with your audience, but then you can learn so much off the back of it with community management, having that constant reply and how you go about that is what's going to make the difference between any other social media platform and also any other engagements or sorry, any other um, activity that you're doing. So I think that's a great way to kind of set the scene with clients that you're working with. It is, you are able to, potentially act off the back of what your customers are directly telling you. There is no guessing work because it came directly from one of your customers, one of your potential customers. So in terms of client pushback, try and set the scene in terms of you have that direct in with them and what you do can make a difference right now versus waiting down the line. Because I think there's an element of reactivity that's really big on TikTok, but it's also really big when it comes to any relationship that you have with a with a consumer customer etc mm. um one other thing that i would just ask is do you have any examples or case studies because i'm just conscious of time that we could share with the, everybody here um that de demonstrates the benefits of strong community management yeah, sure. I was like trying to gatekeep these until um this question, but I feel like I've already we've already mentioned them throughout the course of this webinar. So spoilers. Um, Semrush is a really good one to go away and have a look at, not just on TikTok, but every single platform that they're on. There is rarely a comment that is left without a response. Their tone of voice is consistent and it's so strong. Um, and they're constantly just being recognized for how great their community management team is. I love them. Um, and they even do get like a lot of comments coming in for people saying like I've subscribed to this product because of your your admin or like the people the people that are engaging with us in the comments so I think that is a really good pointer at like that kind of purchase decision that we spoke we spoke about before Duolingo is a super obvious one uh, but I felt like we would rob them not to bring it up um, I just think yeah a lot of people are using their their app or their product off the back of discovering them off social media like I can't go out, I can't leave the house without hearing that stupid Duolingo chime now. Like everyone, everyone's on it. I love it. Um, and I think as well, great example of brands who have just become famous from being known for their like reactivity and their unhingedness. Um, and then of course, our very own Urban Tandoor. I love them. The team do an amazing job on them. They get people visiting from all across the world. Like people visit them, say they're from Australia and they've flown over specifically um, to eat at their restaurant just because of how active they are and how interactive they are um, on TikTok, just responding to every comment and having fun with it. Like, I think they're a really good example of how you can have fun and not have to lean too far into the unhingedness. Like it's just being human and yeah, just having that friendship with your audience. Love all of those. Love all of those. And I would just throw back in cheese its because they're on fire right now. <laughs> so I would just check them, check them out because you'd be able to see it immediately just based on what they're doing with all of the Love Island USA stars. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we have five more minutes and I just wanted to go back to a question that I saw in the channel 
um, because this isn't necessarily community management related, but we get this question on pretty much every single webinar we do. So we have the question, some brands don't usually get trending audios on their profiles or commercial music. What is the best approach to that problem? Yes, good question. A couple of different ways to work around this. Um, I think the main one is you can always um, input the sound, like input the sound off the app through like CapCut and then put it onto TikTok and then it's there on your video. I would just be mindful on this one. It depends on the trending sound. Like if the trending sound is like, a Charlie XCX song and you can't use it because of like literal licensing rights, then um, just be wary that it will get flagged or it will get muted down the track. But if it's like, just like a random sort of trend sound that often float around, I think this is okay. Um, I think as well, bit, get creative around like the type of sound that you want to use. I know everyone's been seeing like this very demure um, trend at the moment. And that's not necessarily a sound that gets like put behind um, a wall where brands can't use it, but it's like, I've seen so many brands recreate it themselves and like, just like take that sound and recreate it in their own voice or like as a voiceover, the man in finance trend is another example of that. Um, so just have fun with it. Like if you have a means of like creating that somehow on your own end, like give it a go because sometimes that then becomes the trending sound that everyone jumps on. But I know I'm like missing the important one, Melina. Um, like there's a really obvious answer that is escaping me right now, I feel. Um, well, I don't know if this is exactly what you're thinking, but we did kind of chat about it earlier where trends aren't the be all end all of content that you're posting on the platform. So if you can't jump on a trend, you can get creative about how you do that through all the things that Chloe already mentioned. If it's just jumping on a trend for trend's sake, maybe you don't have to jump on it and prioritize original content off the back of it. But Essentially, I, I do know that a lot of brands want to have fun and join in on trends. And I think, I don't know if you, I can't remember if you just mentioned this, but there was one example where it was like the the fighting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you can, if you're comfortable, you can re-record because one brand, I can't remember who did it, but one brand kind of did a squeaky sound and it you could tell what it was trying to be, but it wasn't anywhere near the original because they couldn't use it. And in the caption, it just said, what are we supposed to do with a brand account? So you could kind of lean into it, have a bit of fun, mm -hmm. but ultimately don't let trends be your entire uh, strategy. I think that's probably the most important takeaway from that. 100%. Yeah, totally agree. Love it. All right. Well, with two minutes left to circle back to community management and just kind of ending on a useful note, what are three key takeaways that you would recommend for any brand looking to have a, com a successful community management strategy? Yeah, I think the main things that we've covered today is understand who you're talking to, but don't forget who you're talking for. Um, try and be uh, social. It's social media. So like get stuck in. Don't just rely on inbound. Go and speak to people yourselves. Be reactive. Piggyback off other people you know, brands or creators or influencers success. If they're having a bit of a moment, go be cheese it, get in the comments and just infiltrate. Um, and then finally, I think, yeah, a really important one is just know your limits. Does it make sense to comment here? Does it make sense to use this language? Is this a trend that's going to be the ride or die, like be all and end all for my brand success? Like there's another one always around the corner. So sit it out. If it doesn't feel right, don't shoehorn anything. And yeah, just like if it's, if it's not right for your brand or you're second guessing, just it's not worth it. Completely, completely agree. Um, all right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I hope you found this useful, helpful. Thank you, Chloe B, for all of your amazing insights here. I think we all learned a lot, including myself today. So um, as I mentioned, we do these on a monthly basis. Let us know uh, when we send out the email tomorrow, if there's any other webinar topics that you would like us to cover um, and we hope to see you at another one very, very soon. But thank you everyone for joining today and have the best rest of your day. Thanks guys. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye everyone.